You're listening to the preaching podcast from Regency Baptist Church, located in Loomis, California, in the greater Sacramento region. We pray that you'll be blessed by this Bible based message. And it's also our desire that you'll be helped with this message in your personal walk with Jesus and strengthened in your commitment to serve Him daily. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. The Bible says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposed, as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. And let's pray. Fathers, we come to you tonight. I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, help us, God, to glean truths from your word. God, I pray that it would not be just in mind, but also, Lord, in heart. Lord, help us, I pray, to be pleasing in your sight. And Father, may every decision we make, Father, be driven by a heart to please you. Father, to make our God that we serve happy. And I pray that would be our desire tonight. Father, use me, Lord, as your vessel. We ask all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight, we're looking at the subject, the principle of generosity. The principle of generosity. If we were to make a list of what we would consider the most important things in the Christian life, what would it be the most important things that you would deem for a Christian to be or to do? Or we would even call the fruits of the Christian life. I think all of us would say the Word of God would be at the top of that list. Having a relationship with the Word of God is absolutely paramount to having a walk with God, to being what we would call a good Christian. I think all of us would put prayer just hand in hand with that. The Bible and prayer just kind of go hand in hand. It's a package deal. To walk with God, God speaks to us through his word. We speak to him through prayer, unify our spirit towards God. And so if we were to make a list of things that we would deem to be important in the Christian life, Bible and prayer would be near the top or at the top of that list. I think what we do tonight would be at the top of that list, having a church to go to. I absolutely believe that folks that are living in the world that think, well, I can walk with God at home. I don't need a church. I don't believe, we hear this, I don't believe in organized religion. I don't need a church to know the Lord. I don't need a church to have a walk with God. And in part, I do agree with you, but in part, I'm reminded that the Bible says that Christ loved the church so much, he gave himself for it. And if Jesus thought it important enough that he says a part of the reason why I died was to give you a place the church, then it should be important to us too. We can't say that it doesn't matter if God said it was so important, it was one of the reasons that I died. And so church would be near the top of that list. What makes a good Christian? We we might also say being a moral person, having values, having virtues, not living a wicked, sinful lifestyle, uh, being a good family member, a provider of the home or a caretaker of the home. And real easy, it's it's possible to pass over this area of giving in the Christian life almost as a secondary issue. It's not one of the most important things, and of course it's not as important as salvation and believing that Jesus is the Son of God and the deity of Christ. But we are kidding ourselves if we think that the Bible does not have much to say in this area of giving. I believe one of the most vital elements of a Christian's heart towards God is in this matter of giving. And all that to say this, giving is not a secondary issue. Giving is very much a matter of the heart. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, your heart is connected by what things you put your heart into. What do you invest into? What do you give your time to? What do you spend time thinking about? What do you dream about? You know, there's things in life that we'll give towards. Maybe you invest into a business or you invest into your home or you invest into somebody's life. And it works this way. When we give of ourselves to something, we become connected with that thing that we give to. You know, we see things in the world that 
we're disconnected with, and it's easy to be critical because our heart isn't connected with that. But as we give to the work of God, something amazing happens in the heart of God's people. God tethers your heart to the work of Christ because you're invested into it. So God tells us in the word of God that your giving is connected to your heart. It's hard to have a heart that's on fire for the Lord, but to not be invested in the work of God. Your heart is connected by what things you put it into. All that to say this, you should have deep stock in God's work. You know, we use that term, you know, put stock in something or to put an investment into something. Uh, if I can put it these ways, church is not a drive through uh, where you make your demands and, you know, let me just drive through and get my, get my service as I go along my way. Church is not a service where you pay your monthly dues and you get your demands met or else. Church is not an exclusive club where we just make an appearance and save face while you live a different life outside of that occasional interaction. I believe this, church is a place where God has designed you to have stock, to have investment, we we're familiar with those terms, into his work. Let me put it like this, the furtherance of the work of God is directly connected to your investment. That's the way that God designed the church. The opportunity is to be a part of this work calls for an involvement where you can partner with God in an eternal work. God says, I'm gonna create this church and establish the church and I'm calling you to partner with me to this work that we do in preaching the gospel. On the other side of it, we could say this, that the shortcomings of ministry can also be due to an apathy or an indifference to the work of God. I'll ask it plainly. What would happen if everybody decided Everything else is more important than me giving to church. What would happen to the place that we call the church? How do we pay the light bills? How do we go forward with the things that we do for Christ? How, how do we invest into people? Well, I, I love to say that it just takes good intentions. It takes people giving to the work of God. And the reason that Regency Baptist Church is here today is that for many, many years, people have decided, I want to invest in something eternal. And I'm going to connect my heart to the work of God when I could give it to other things because this is a worthy area of investment in my life. We, we see shortcomings of we're not able to do this or we're not able to support more missionaries or man, we got to make cutbacks and different things. And everybody knows what it's like to kind of trim the budget. Food prices go up, gas prices go up. Maybe you get laid off from a job or something happens, an unexpected health, medical bill, things. And we say, man, man, we got we, we to gotta tighten up a little bit. But there are certain areas of life that are, we would call non-negotiables. You got to get food. You got to pay the rent. You got to pay the mortgage. And God's work is right in there with it. Giving to the work of God ought to be a non-negotiable in the Christian life. Why? It's a heart matter. God says, this is not a secondary issue. This is not just a small thing of, you know, let's go soul winning, let's read the Bible, let's pray, let's, let's give, let's love people. And if you're able to give on the side, that's great. God says, no, I measure the heart of a man with his investment and what he gives. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I was talking to our deacons about this, uh, this, this evening as we met. You know, we talk about missions this month. And giving to missionaries, we support 63 missionaries in 36 countries. I kind of like that if you're dyslexic. Um, but missions is a terrible, it is a terrible business model. If we're trying to grow as a church and make everything look better and have more ministries and pay our personnel more and do things more and all of these things, then we wouldn't say let's send our, our money to places where we might never see the fruit of it. We won't directly see what God does with it. We're giving by faith, but very little of what we give towards missions do we actually see. And very little of it is directly connected with what we see around us. Now, I believe on a spiritual level, God will always bless a church that gives towards missions. But I'm saying this, if you're gonna create a business model in our world, the idea of what we do with missions would be a very foolish way to build this kingdom, if you will. If our only purpose was to build this place, to have the nicest and the best and all of these things, 
missions and what we do with it would be a horrible way to do it. Because what you give to missions, it all goes overseas. Or it goes to missionaries that we deal with that come through here and that we're able to be a blessing to in a number of ways. It's not a great model, but we, we do it for this reason. In the book of Philippians, I've preached a message on uh, the Philippian church and the model that the Philippi, uh, church at Philippi gave us to give to missions. And Paul said this, I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Paul here was encouraging the church at Philippi saying, one thing that you need to be encouraged with is that as you've given to the work of God, God has blessed you to your account. So in other words, as we give to missionaries that are around the world, I think of India and Tanzania. How many of you have looked at these flags and you try to guess which countries are which? You pull your phone out and try to, okay, what's this flag mean? Okay, don't do that now if that hasn't crossed your mind. But we look at all these different countries around the world and we think, man, whatever God's doing there, whatever God... In other words, God's saying the money that you give to Cambodia and the missionaries in Cambodia and the souls that get saved in Cambodia, because you give and because you pray, you are connected there with the fruit that they get, and that fruit is put on your account. God says, I have an account that shows all the right scores and all the right manners, and when you give to missions, you get that fruit too. We don't see that with new light fixtures and better buildings, but God stores it for us in heaven. God blesses us by that account. So we give to missions knowing this, that God has generated a way for him to allow us to be involved and to make a difference, and it is in this area of giving. So easily do we pass by this thing of giving and just think, well, I'm going to do everything else, but that area I'm just going to keep to myself. Number one, I want you to see a few thoughts tonight on this principle of generosity. Number one, giving has a responsibility. Giving has a responsibility. God reminds us that we are stewards over the possessions that we have given to us. What we have, in other words, belong to God, and we will give an answer for it. Luke 16 says, we will give an account for the stewardship in which God gave to us. It's like this. When you were growing up, your parents might have given you a job. And they might have said, here, I want you to do this task. It might have been, you know, when you were a little kid, to clean your room or to pick something up or to do a little, a small chore. But then as you grow up, it might have been bigger like for boys, you know, to weed whack the yard or to mow the grass or, you know, girls to, uh, uh, you know, clean, clean the uh, bathrooms or to clean the kitchen or to do all the. And as you grow, the, the, the stewardship might have increased. And then what happens is your parent will come back and say, let's see how you did. And they might have said, man, it looks great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Or it might have been, hey, you missed a spot. Or have you been playing this whole time? I told you to do this work, and it looks like you spent about five minutes doing it, and then you were done. I was giving my parents a hard time. And uh, when we were growing up, uh, my, uh, my mom at the gym, they still live in the property where I uh, was raised at. They have about five acres there and many, many oak trees on the property. And every now and then during the summertime, uh, uh, Brother Jim would come to me and wake me up in my room or, you know, I'd be watching TV or something like a good teenager did and uh, say, all right, Stephen, we're, we're going to do some work today. I want you to go pick up sticks. And I said, I would do anything else in the world except for pick up sticks because the job never finished. It was never over. It was not humanly possible. You could have had an army of people to go on that property but all the oak trees and the acreage, there were always more sticks. And I thought, give me anything else because I know this job is never going to end. And I'm the kind of person, if, if there's a job to do, I'm going to do it as quickly as possible. I'm not one of those people that's going to sit there and with a fine you know, tooth comb, just do you know, to perfection. I want to do a good job, but I want to do it quickly. That, that's just the way that I'm wired. That's how I've always been. And I always got discouraged with that. Pick up sticks, and I'm thinking but it's never going to end. And sometimes it was evident that I worked for a little bit and then decided, you know what, there's a basketball court over there. I'd rather shoot some hoops and get some practice time in. Or maybe I worked really good and got that, hey, good job, you did a great, you did a great work. That's what stewardship is. God says, I've given some things into your responsibility and I'm gonna come one day and check up on what you've done. We understand that God sees all of what we do, but we are stewards. That is our responsibility. Now, this is the difference. We are not owners. We are stewards. 
God is the owner. Now, our responsibility is this, that God has given us a direct command in Scripture to give to the work of God. Now, anything else you give in life to, to people and God puts in your heart to give to some charity organization or, or whatever it may be, great. But that is not commanded. What is commanded is give to a local New Testament church. That's the biblical model. We, we don't have the option to say, okay, God is supposed to give 10%. That's what a tithe is, one-tenth. That's the definition of a tithe. But God, I'm going to give it to this organization because I saw a commercial and the dogs looked really cute and God just pulled on my heartstrings and I'm going to give to that. That's great, but God commanded us to give to the work of God. To tithing is sometimes a debatable subject. And if I could remind you this about tithing, it is not something of the law. Tithing predated the law with Abraham to Melchizedek. But also in Matthew 23, we see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees and he says, you're tithing, you're doing this, you're doing that but you're forgetting the weightier matters of the law. And he says at the end of the verse, don't leave both things undone. Very easily could he have said, you, you're tithing, but you don't need to do that anymore. What he said was keep tithing, but don't forget the heart matters. Don't forget the important matters. Don't just do the things. Do it the way that I intended. We are absolutely commanded by God to give to his work. We have a responsibility in this when we give, we model Christ. You think about the story of Jesus as he walked this earth. Jesus lived a very meager lifestyle. He lived a very, a very content lifestyle. Many times we see Jesus going from town to town, staying in different homes and getting food from a number of different ways. And we don't know all the details of that, but it's very evident that Jesus did not come to build a big name and a big lifestyle for himself. And if we're to truly model Christ, the model of Christ is Jesus himself was very giving in his lifestyle in this world. Giving has a responsibility. Again, this is not some secondary issue of, well, if you do, great, but if you don't, not a big deal. Absolutely, we have been given stewardship by God. We are commanded by God, but we have a model to follow with Jesus Christ. Number two, giving has a reason. You know, God, everything God does has a reason. God doesn't just say, oh, we're just going to see how this goes. We do that sometimes. Hey, we're going to have a plan and let, let's, let's just see how it goes for a little bit. If it works out, great. But if it doesn't, well, we can always change the plan. The Lord always does things for a reason. And watch this. Here's the reason. Because his way is best. You know, we can trust this, that if God has a reason, we can trust his reasoning. You might question my reasoning for how I do things, and I might question your reasoning for how you do things, because we know that sometimes we fail, and sometimes we don't have the best reasons. But if God has a reason for all that he's commanded us to do, if anything, we know this, that we can trust his reasoning. He has a reason. I think one of the reasons of tithing, and we can speculate a lot of this, but one of the obvious reasons is to teach us contentment. Paul said in Philippians, he says, I I've lived both lifestyles. I've learned to have a lot, and I've learned to have a little. And truth be told, in life, I think most people can say that. They look back on their lives and say, there's times where we struggled. And there's times where maybe we weren't living luxurious, lavish lifestyles, but we weren't struggling to, meet, to make end, ends meet. We weren't struggling maybe going month to month. We, we've lived in both ways. And if that could be a reminder to us, it's this. That life is in a constant state of change. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we get a bonus or sometimes the, the bank account is good and then just in a moment it can be taken away. So in other words, God says, don't get your heart connected to things, but learn contentment. God, if you're blessing, great. But Lord, if it's hard right now, great. You know how it is to prepare a meal and uh, to give that to your children and to work hard for it and to uh, provide for it and to go through all of what is necessary and you know you get the meat set out and you cook the uh, uh, the healthy things and you say okay I want to make this a balanced meal for our child I want to make it good and and those who put their heart into that and present it and put it on the table for their child and then get respond a response like this I don't like that aren't you gonna eat your food 
I'm not hungry. You can eat it? No. No, you're going to eat it. No. No, now you're really going to eat it, you know? <laughs> Doesn't it hurt a little bit to say, I've, I've worked hard to give you this, and I put my heart into this, and I want to be a blessing to you, and I've loved you, and I've given this to you, and your response is, well, I don't like that. And we may not physically do that to the Lord, but when we do not have contentment in our heart, that is exactly what we look like. God says giving is a great reminder to live a contented life. A contented life. Some people get so addicted to money that it's every dollar and everything. And, we gotta be, and I believe we ought to be diligent. We ought to have stewardship. We ought to be responsible. But a reason for giving is it teaches contentment. I believe it also teaches sacrifice. Giving will never be convenient. Right now in America, it's, it's really not convenient to give. Every dollar counts and everything that we go, goes towards. And, and if it was my logic, I would say this, don't give. Don't give because it's hard. Let, let's wait till the economy bounces back. Let's wait till that promotion comes. Let's wait for the right time. But watch this. If we're always waiting for the right time, there will never be the right time. Because we get more in life, and what do we do? We commit more. We, we get the bigger house, or we get the better car, we get those things. And God isn't against those things. But I'm just here to say this, that one thing you learn about giving in life is that it will always be inconvenient. It will always be a bit of a struggle. Giving will always demand sacrifice. When we learn to sacrifice from things, we learn to live without. We learn to sacrifice and say, God, me being right with you is more important than having this thing or doing this thing or enjoying this thing. That's a reason that God has given to us. And another reason is a very practical reason. We find way back in the Old Testament and an example in the New Testament as well is the practical way that God has instituted for the church to function so that we don't have to constantly look to, to, to the government and we don't have to be a part of some big denomination where we answer to somebody in an office that we've never met far away at some convention or some conference and say, well, as long as you're sending the checks, we'll do what you've told us to do. I, I believe in being an independent church, but the only way that works is if God's people invest into their church. God doesn't call you to give to every church in the United States. We we invest in the place where God's given to us. And the practical means, how do we get the lights on? How, how do we do the things that we do? How do we have a bus? How do we have vans? How, how do we have staff? How do we, how do we do these things? How do we have people working in the ministry? It's God's people giving that allows us to do those things. It's a practical means for providing for the church. So watch this. When we give, the church thrives. When we give more, the church thrives more. Man, we're struggling. Why are we struggling? Well, how's our giving? Number three, giving has a reminder. Giving has a reminder, first of all, that everything I have belongs to God. You know, God calls us to give regularly. You, you might give occasionally. Maybe there's a Christmas time or an anniversary gift or a birthday gift, but giving is a regular thing. God says, the first fruits of all thine increase. In other words, you get an increase, God says, I want you to give on it. And every time you give, it's a reminder that everything I have belongs to him. My body, my family, my life, my home, my things, my possessions, my job, all of it belongs to God. And watch this, it was never mine to begin with. Giving has a reminder, everything I have belongs to God. It has this reminder, everything I have was given to me by God. You know, God could have said, I'm the owner of the universe. Hey, you figure it out. Good luck. We'll see how this goes. God has given to us, and as Americans, far beyond what we will ever deserve. And you might say, well, I live in this bracket in America or in California. Even what we would consider to be struggling or a poverty level in America and California would still be in the top 1% to 5% in the world. We have it better than almost anybody. You know, we're struggling for things, and I'm not trying to say that it's not maybe a difficult time that some people are going through, but I am saying this, that God's given to us so much, and God's the one who gives us a job. God's the one who gives us things. God's the one who gives us income. We, he is the source, and we are the vessel. 
giving us another reminder that everything I have is temporal. 1 Timothy chapter 6 gives us this warning that the love of money is the root of all evil. That's a very definite statement. God says the root of everything is a heart issue, and it's a heart issue with money. You say, I don't know if that's true. God said it, not me. Everything I have is temporal. Have you ever had somebody break something that you really liked or ruin something that you just bought in the frustration of, no, I just got that or, oh, we just bought that. Man, I was excited to use it or it looked so nice. And you're reminded what again, once again, that everything eventually breaks or it rusts or it wears down, this and that. Everything is temporal. First Timothy chapter six, Paul tells us, inspired by God, that we came into this world with nothing and we will leave this world with nothing. In other words, God has an expiration date on everything we own. I'm the kind of person, I live by expiration dates. If it's past the expiration date, good luck. It's going down the sink and in the trash, we're getting a new one. Some of you like to live on the edge and a day after, a couple days after, you give it the smell test. Oh, it's good to go. I'm the kind of person, I'm not even going to smell it. I mean, somebody smarter than me put that date on the carton of milk and especially something like milk. I'm not risking it. I can, I can afford another gallon of milk. <laughs> you know, we're good. God says everything in life is that way. It's got an expiration date. Nothing that we have is going to last forever. The new phone in a couple of months is going to be the old phone. The new vehicle in a year or two is going to be the old model. Oh, that old thing. But when you got it, it was, whoa, look at all the bells and whistles and this and that. The home that you say, man, it's great. 10, 20 years. Oh, it's so out of date. We just did this kitchen. Thousands of dollars. Now, it's so yesterday, you know. <laughs> Everything in life is temporal. Giving to God's work, can I say this, is one of the only ways to ensure that your investment will have a legacy, that it will last for eternity. And then lastly, number four, giving has a return. God promises blessing to those who give. And I can say this, but if you give, you've experienced it. He says, I will open the windows of heaven. It's been one of the greatest blessings in life to see as we have dedicated ourselves to give faithfully to the work of God. And to the best of, of my knowledge and ability, we have given faithfully to the work of God. I'm not commanding you to do this. We're called to practice it as well. And to see that even in times of struggle and in times of, okay, Lord, it's working good now, that God has promised and God always comes through on his promises. God promises blessings to those who give. I would challenge you this, if this is something new for you or if this is an area you struggle with, and it's this, to prove God. And God uses those words, if you would prove me, and I will open the windows of heaven. You just try me. Try it out. See what happens and see what God does. God promises blessings to those who give. God provides the needs for those who give. We quote that verse. He, uh, God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But who did he promise that to? He promised that to the church that was giving. That was given to the church at Philippi. Paul had just commended them. He says, you've given to my necessity. You've been a blessing. You've been an encouragement. And I want you to know that God has put fruit to your account because you give. Hey, there is blessing in it. And I promise you this, that as long as you give, God will provide for every need that you have. He connected that promise of providing and supplying to the church that committed themselves to give. God has a return to go beyond that, can I say it this way, that God multiplies what you give and uses it beyond your potential. We find so many examples of this in the Bible. David and Goliath. David did not have enough strength to defeat Goliath. He didn't have the military experience to defeat Goliath. But he gave himself to God and God used him in a way that was beyond himself to get the victory that day. We see the little lad with his lunch and he came and he just packed his lunch probably just for him that day maybe for a few friends, and Jesus used that lunch. What did he do? He multiplied it. We find examples of that all throughout Scripture. And here's the principle, that what you have is better in God's hands than it is in your hands. 
I remember having a room, uh, not a roommate, a friend in Bible college, and uh, I was needing a job, and he was walking down the hallway saying, anybody need a job? Anybody need a job? And, and I was looking for a job. I came back my senior year, and I was promised my job would be there after I interned. It was not there, praise the Lord. And I was proposing soon, and life is happening soon. And I thought, Lord, this is going to go bad fast if I don't get a job. And I was filling out applications, and I was praying. And there were weeks going by, and I'm, I'm starting to panic. I'm starting to get nervous. And then this guy's walking down our hallway saying, anyone need a job? Anyone need a job? And I said, hey, come here. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, oh, I got this other job, but I already had this other interview, and I feel bad because I I committed to this one now. It's better pay, but I don't want to go back to that other guy that I told him I would accept the job without giving him some kind of reference. He he wanted to hire somebody from the college here. The college has a reputation. And uh, hey, would you? And I said, yes, (laughs) yes, <laughs> I've been praying for that. And I said, man, God, you, you, and I said his name, I said, you have no idea how great of, I've been, I've been just begging God, praying to God, and just hit every single roadblock, and you've been such an answer to prayer. I remember his eyes got this big. And he's thinking, I just, you know, just, almost like, I didn't even think about it that way. I was just looking to tell people, because I felt bad about my position, but Wow. And can I say that that's what being involved in the work of God feels like? It feels like, wow, I was able to make a difference there. Wow, I just gave my little bit to missions, but it went to that missionary who was praying for God to meet their needs or whatever was going on in their life. Wow, I was just giving what I could. But God sees that and God will always bless that. God has a way of multiplying what you give and using it beyond your potential. I promise you this, your giving will be directly connected to your heart. Those are God's words. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I've said it since I've pastored, and I'll always have this principle. I don't know what you give in the church. I don't know the giving statements. I probably can guess that you give. I might see you put something in the plate. A lot of us give online these days, and that's fine. I don't know what it is, so don't look at me and say, oh, the pastor's preaching to me because he knows I've been shortchanging the Lord. I honestly have no clue. No clue. And I do that on purpose because if you're the one that does give a lot and you have a certain sin, I don't want to be scared not to preach on that sin, you know? (laughs) This is between you and God, but God says this is going to reveal your heart. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This thing of missions, it's a terrible business model but it's a great church model. It's a great way to get God's blessing on a church. It's a great way to have God's favor upon your life. This thing of giving, tithing, and offering, and alms to people. Again, it's a, it's a terrible model for how to structure your finances. People might say that church is ripping you off, but it's a great way to use your life for Christ. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us in this area of giving. Father, our generosity. Father, you've commanded us, but you've also given to us. And in reality, all you command us to give is just a small part of what you've given to us in the first place. Father, I pray that we'd be reminded of what this principle of stewardship means. Father, that we are managers and we will stand before God, we'll stand before you one day, give an account for the stewardship that you've given to us. Father, I pray that we'd be found faithful As the Bible says, not giving grudgingly or of necessity. Oh, I have to give, but a cheerful giver. Father, I pray that we would find it exciting, that we would have enthusiasm, Lord, in having a part in the work of God and what we get to give towards. It's a great thing, Lord, to see what your money goes towards. It's a great thing to see what our life goes towards. And Lord, I pray that you'd use us, Lord, greatly in this area of giving. Help us, I pray. Thank you for listening to the preaching podcast from Regency Baptist Church. We pray that God has used this message to stir your heart for the gospel's sake. To get information about our ministry or to get in contact with us, please visit us at regencybaptistchurch.org. If you were encouraged by this Bible message, share it with a friend, contact us, or tune in next time to the Regency Baptist Church Preaching Podcast.